It's nice and quite unusual to see so many people here on a Sunday morning. It's a morning for a talk, but I will try to keep the talk within bounds so that there will be some time also for questions afterwards. People would like to ask something or say something. Say, I didn't understand what you meant by that. Could you say that again or whatever. This question about how do we make a decision? What is choice? Where do my decisions come from? Has popped up very frequently recently. All over the past retreats too. And last Sunday when we had a discussion period, the discussion period was opened up by someone new here for the first time, wondering where do my decisions come from? Often they just come from the head and it seems much better when they come from the heart. And we were discussing this for quite a while and then sort of drifted on to other things. And even the other night in watching a tape, it came up again in connection with, can one make a decision to stop addictive behavior? So I thought maybe this morning we can look at that again freshly, the whole, this whole question of choice, free will, decision making. This thought is, this talk is not planned out at all. All we've got is the topic. And I hope it is a topic for all of us. We, we all find it interesting so that as this mind here, which is a spokes mind for all the minds here for a while, and then there can be other spokes minds, is looking and expressing what is being asked and seen or listened to or discovered, expressing that in words. And can we all participate in this process? Looking, listening, following the expression, maybe sometimes the expression, particularly if one is from a foreign country, as there are some people here, may be difficult. This expression is not linked up yet in the brain with meaning, meaningful association. So it may be difficulty, but not to get stuck with difficulty of one word, but to flow along together with what we're looking at which is this whole decision-making process. Choosing. You've got to make a choice, we, we hear and we say to ourselves, I have to choose, I have to make a choice. I have to make up my mind what to choose. What, what is that? Can we start from scratch to look at this decision-making process, the choosing, and begin from the very beginning to become aware of all the assumptions that are made in this age-old expression, I have to choose, I have to make a decision, make up my mind. The assumption, the, the, the primal assumption in all of this isn't there, isn't it, is that there is someone there, an entity which I call me, the I, the ego or self, an entity there that has to make up her or his mind, has to make a decision, choose. Is this an assumption that there is an entity or do we feel this is so? Because this is how we talk to ourselves, to each other. I have to decide, 
make a decision, I have to choose. The way we put it in the language we use, the grammar, at least in the world that uses this kind of grammar, maybe some other languages which don't, suggests or posits that there is someone there, independent, separate from what she, he is looking at, the facts, the thoughts, the remembrances. I'm separate from that. I've got to look at what's going on in my mind and see that, think of all the possibilities, and then I have to reach a choice. There's someone there, independent from all the ongoings, inside and out, who has to or is making the choice. And we're questioning this assumption from the very start. We're not going along with it. We may find out in the end, yes, there is an entity. But we're not starting out with that assumption. Or we're seeing that it is an assumption for most of us, most of the time, an unquestioned assumption. That there is a me who has to make a choice, reach a decision. We could go ad infinitum into how this arose in our history, in our personal history, in our language history. But the fact is, right now, I feel I have to make a choice. That's how I talk to myself. I have to choose what topic to take for the talk. The person last week she had a concrete example. A book was sent to me. I was asked to illustrate that book. And something in me was into it. Said, go for it. And, uh, but the heart said, no. So that's an interesting thing, too. Are there two separate decision-making instances, the head and the heart? That was implied. And maybe the guts is the third one. On the gut level, I have a strong feeling this is what I have to do. So that's the third instance. The head, the heart, the gut. <laughs> and wondering about this, does this also come from an instance, uh, a, a, a me? I have to wonder about all of that, whether there is a decision maker in the heart, and, the gut, the mind, is there a fourth sort of towering over these three? I must come to clarity about all of that. There's that me there that needs clarity. Separate, always separate from everything else. The heart separate from the, the guts and the, the brain, or the brain separate from the heart and the guts. And the final authority inside who investigates all of that needs to reach clarity. Do you see how complicated it gets the way we think and feel because we think that way? That's the amazing thing. The power of the way we think on our convictions, our body too, involving all the organs. One can say, wait a minute, but we do make choices. Don't, don't uh, wipe out this choice-making, what, entity? We make choices, we, whether to illustrate the book or not. Whether to talk about choice or to talk about listening to the birds. 
whether to go to school or uh, to keep the job. But what, what's going on? Can we ask it? Are we free? Free to ask in the language I'm using. Let's face it. It's, it always posits this me. And when I use language that doesn't posit that, that so much, people sort of say, why do you use this unnatural language <laughs> of saying, just looking up, there being awareness. Come out and say, I'm aware. It sounds much more natural. Or oh, we're aware. I don't say one is aware, of course, one also posits sort of a wishy-washy entity. <laughs> <laughs> People often in spiritual training are trained not to use the I word. So one begins to use the this person word. But... Uh, it's possible. I mean, we can't reject and, and uh, create a totally new language, although in becoming more and more aware of the power of putting the way we put things, one can be more careful in choosing words or saying, this is just tentative. I'm looking. But there's just looking. So, with this sort of controversy, is there someone who chooses or is someone who who reaches the decision. Can we look at what goes on when we say, I have to make a decision, and when we say, I have reached a decision? What is going on in this mind? To look at it factually, directly, actually, rather than deciding intellectually, philosophically, whether there is free will or not, which is what we usually do. I used to be engaged in that for years in my teens, I loved that controversy, whether it was free will or predestination. And I almost chose my friends on the basis of whether they're willing to correspond and talk about this endlessly. And I don't remember how much that was ever linked to watching what goes on. I was rather getting more philosophers on your side or the scientists or reading with this um, conflict in mind. Is there free will or predestination? And somebody sounded good. That's a, it's a supporting argument for free will or for predestination. So, is it possible for us beings here, and not just for those beings here, be very careful, we always remind it, don't just think that you're so special here. We, I don't think well, I don't know what people think. <laughs> I have to watch whether that thought takes over. Because in that moment, the vision is reborn. Is it possible for us here to look directly at thought? Not as an entity, but for thought to become visible or to be visible with all of its linked remembrances and associations and emotions. Is it possible to be, for that to be visible? Yeah, visible, inwardly, transparent. Because it's one thing to think about the fact that we're thinking, and another is to see a thought that has just emerged and has hit one in the guts has triggered uh, feelings here in this area or in the solar plexus, in the heart. To see that happening, I thought, oh my God, I have to decide. I still haven't decided. Is it possible for thoughts to become visibly noticeable, uh, palpably experienceable, the thought with, it, with its connected sensations, emotions, and also to see directly how emotions trigger thoughts. I don't like to feel this way, or I feel in my guts this is so, this is a good feeling. 
and for these thoughts again to trigger more emotions of satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And these feelings which are more physical issue more thoughts. Can, can that or fractions of this process, for moments at a time <coughs> at least, come into awareness? Is there a thought now? I don't know what she's saying. Oh, yeah, yes, there was the thought. I understand, or I don't understand. To see that thought, not just to go with the content, I don't understand or understand, but the thought arising. And it's just a thought. It's a thought. The direct insight into something isn't a thought. It's just seeing something. Seeing the thought, I have to make a choice. And what's connected with that thought, I, separate from what I am choosing from, what I'm looking at, as though there was an I looking at her mind, or the situation, and having to deal with the situation. Or can there be a switching into just perceiving or becoming aware that Thoughts about what needs to be done, thoughts about needing to make decisions, thoughts about all the various factors about the situation that decision has to be made, personal desires that come in, fears. I don't want this or this is what I really want, but maybe it's not altruistic enough, maybe it's, it's too selfish to see all of that streaming and welling up of thoughts and emotions and not positing anyone separate from that. The idea one is separate from that is part of that whole whirlpool or flow of thoughts, feelings and emotions. Part of that. The thought of a separate entity. You don't have to buy that. You need to discover it, whether this is so. Yeah. Well, while we've been talking, there have been this twittering of the birds. Is that, is that there? Is there a separate listener? It's there, isn't it? The moment one says, I'm hearing those birds, it's already positive. I'm there, they're there. I'm hearing them. But thought has said that, and not just now, but since, I don't know how long, thousands of years, thought has said, I'm hearing the birds. But we're questioning whether there is a separate entity hearing the birds or whether bird call and listening is an interwoven reality which only becomes separate, divided entities the moment thought says what's going on. As thought has that capacity to divide, to compartmentalize, to separate. So in, can we listen? right now, or can there be listening? That's, for an instant, is there a perception without the word, without the thought? Thought comes very quickly, particularly if this is never worked on or looked at before. Sometimes people say the word bird is totally linked with this perception. It's, that's what I hear, bird, and tweet, tweet. But not to assume that it has to be this way. But to see that there's different processes to, to, to listen clearly, openly, and to say I'm listening and that's a bird I'm listening. The moment the thought 
process has the upper hand. What kind of a bird is it? Probably a such and such a bird. I like those. Oh, I wish they had some other birds here which sing so beautifully. <laughs> In the south, they have mockingbirds. Wish they had those here. See? Then there's no longer the openness of listening without someone there who chooses, likes and dislikes. Our habitual way of putting things into sentences and conceptualizations creates the separate entity, me, which is a thought, a cluster of thoughts which, with remembered background, like any other cluster of thoughts with remembered background. All thoughts come from remembered background. And this one is no different from any other. Only has tremendous more power, more linkage to every organ and gland and muscle in the body, ready to trigger emotions of defense, aggression, grief, sadness, my loss, my uh, reputation, my needs, my fears. So here the question becomes, is it possible to just listen to all that's going on and not stick with this entity that we are so attached to and so convinced is suffering everything that is happening to us, the need for making decisions. The indecision, the flip-flopping around, the difficulty. Be not invested and identified with that idea of an entity, but look at the situation as it presents itself. The book to be illustrated. As somebody brought up, well, if I need some money, maybe I'll illustrate it even. I don't like the job particularly, because I have to pay my rent. Maybe I have wife, husband, family, kids, companion. Maybe the, to look at the book, is that book, let's say, racist, sexist? I don't want to be identified with it. I, I just don't want to have my illustrations in a book that, I, that propagates something I feel is false, is misleading, not clarifying. So then is it, is it difficult to make a choice? Need the money? I don't want to be identified with this. Can See, the, the words I'm using is still using the I, but this can be looked at much clearer and much fresher and sharper without all this I involvement, just the intelligence of looking at facts that speak loudly or quietly for themselves. My need for paying the rent, racist literature. Which to illustrate or not to illustrate. See, one can look at things on two entirely different levels. One is out of this openness in which we can also call intelligence. Not, this has nothing to do with IQ. It's looking freely without anchorage in some particular vested interest. Or if there is vested interest that needs to be protected, maybe I have stock in the book company that it wants my illustration. <laughs> Can that be just one of the factors of the whole situation that I'm looking at or that is being looked at? Not the overriding, most important and emotionally linked factor, but seeing it as one of the many factors that need to be looked at. And out of the looking will come what will be done. Because there's no investment, no, no particular 
grave push or pull, which, is, which always comes out of meanness. Me and my interests are in there, but not overriding, not exclusively dominating, which most of the time when we have this idea of I have to make a choice or a decision, usually we come out of this me capsule. Not, we don't come out of it, we, we stay in it and, and decide in that. So, is it possible to begin to observe thoughts that come up, emotions that they create, language that deals with it? I must, I must. And, and see it all as one ever-evolving process of thinking, remembering, anticipating, with this powerful cluster of me-thought in the middle of it, dominating. Is that possible to see? Without finding fault with that? Because then that's again me finding fault with me. The seeing which is clear is not me-centered and therefore not judgmental. Not choosing, just clarifying and revealing what's there. And very often, out of such a state of mind and body, which includes what's around one, there's not a feeling of making a choice, this versus that, but doing what all of that together suggests to do, that to be done. What all of that sort of, the, maybe you find a better word for it. which is a, a state with great sensitivity to other people, to the environment, to the work situation, the home situation, to, to, to how other people feel beside me, what I will do, how it will impact others. Not that I think I ought to be altruistic and think of the others, then that, and then there's not looking and sensing openly what is going on here and in each other. Because ideas of what I ought to, with their negativity and positivity, block out the, the uh, delicacy of, of movements in, in human beings that are observable, sense, sensible, when there's not this idea-ridden approach. It's sometimes why it's so difficult to reach a decision because there's so many facts that one doesn't know and yet one can't expect or hope or wait to, to know everything. It's impossible, impossible. We have to work with limited facts. But can the limited facts be looked at openly and not just out of this dominating self-center? What, what, what I need for my safety, happiness, and, and we're not saying it's something bad, but it's something overriding and distorting and preventing sensitivity for the wider situation, which always involves other people, environment, children. And just to have what I need as one of the factors in it, not the overriding one, not the only one, and not linked up with the emotions. Seeing and looking 
is free from this link, link up, which doesn't mean it's callous. That's often the conclusion drawn. Well, if you're not emotional about something, you must be very indifferent or callous. Callousness means suppression of emotions. Indifference does too, keeping them under control. In this state of a thought or something seen causes an emotional linkage or emotional feeling, that is one of the factors taking place right now. So, if there is some insight or sensitivity to what goes on in the head as a decision in quotation marks must be reached, what goes in the intellect, what goes on in the heart, what goes on in the guts, what goes on in one's whole background that pushes toward one way and also pushes toward another way and then the conflict created. If there is an, a, a gentle, open, allowing all of that to be seen, aware of it, without judgment, not preferring one over the other. That's, again, a me cluster in the stream of thought, sticking out like a rock, which inhibits the free flow, creates a disturbance. When, when that is seen, it's not a disturbance anymore. See, there's something that is very <coughs> important to me or gets me all upset to see that. Then head and heart and God is, is just part of that whole flow of a, a living human being, aware at least at times of what's going on in himself, herself, without judgment. A decision may come easy, may come hard, mistakes may be made, because not all the facts were known, and new facts develop as we go. So can that again be looked at? We talked about it the other night or whenever. Mistakes can be corrected, sometimes they can't. Both is a fact, they are correctable or they are not correctable. So learning as we go about the limitation of what we call choosing or making decisions and yet not being invested in the decision, in the, what one has reached, what one thinks one has reached, but it just was what presented itself finally. Maybe this is time, maybe for stopping and listening to what people wish to say or ask about this. Do you have to close your eye in order to see a thought? Why, why, why didn't you experiment with it? Do you? Of course, maybe not right now you feel on the spot. Let me just put you on the spot. Open your eyes and listen. Is the word airplane coming up? And are the eyes open or closed? <laughs> Does it depend on it? Do you think because I've got my eyes closed this is the way it should be? Could be. Well, that's, that's another thing. I've wondered about that. Whether you, when you have your eyes closed, 
suppose that you've seen things more clearly. I find it easier to talk than to see all kind of different things coming, you know, sense stimulation. Partly by now it probably has become a habit. Partly, but it's really easier to give a talk with. Also, it doesn't create this you sitting there, me sitting here. This, uh, It's very feelable that we're all here, but it very quickly happens when the eyes see something that something is associated. It doesn't have to. The walls aren't there, uh, you don't see walls, enclosures when the eyes are closed. But it doesn't mean you have to close the eyes to be without walls either, I'm not saying that. Just the other day, wasn't it, in a staff meeting or so? One person said uh, she's working with a therapist or someone, and um, they were talking about something. He said, wait a minute there, aren't you withdrawing from something or um, escaping from something, wasn't it? Something like that said. And she said, she became aware of it and felt that was very helpful. Uh, is that what you're hinting at?
Well, what, what has to, why has to be one way or the other? Right. Somebody says something to you, uh, you saw this way or that way, and then watch. Is, is, the, is the first reaction in her case, maybe having set this up, and you pay money for it, you may say, all right, I'll look. But somebody in the street saying, you know, you're pretty pushy, I mean, you personally, oh boy, uh, I don't feel that's helpful at all. I get angry and hurt and carry it around for days or weeks and only waiting for an opp opportunity to tell him or her that she's pushy too. <laughs> With the therapist, I wouldn't think of that, although some people have told me they have therapists that if they asked, said that to the therapist, he would say, what are you, why are you escaping again? In other words, the therapist isn't in this thing. He's or she's sitting here, and you're the subject. He's out of it. <laughs> I mean, not out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be presumptuous. I didn't mean that. But it's, uh, it's not a mutual thing. So, and then, the, the, of course, the question is, you put yourself in a situation, you pay money, you have a good therapist who points things out, you see things, and because you some see something, at that moment it's revealed, and then, I mean, you're not sitting in that office eight hours a day. You come home. And then, does it operate? That one sees something again as it comes up for oneself? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, ultimately, you're, you're on your own. <laughs> Here we come together, have a talk like this. We have meetings, retreats. But from the whole year, our whole lifetime, these are small fractions of time, uh, but we're with ourselves all the time, and how are we with ourselves? Dreaming, dreaming about enhancing this capsule, or fearing for the security of the capsule, anticipating trouble in the future for the capsule, and trying to make sure the future for the capsule. Capsule meaning me, you know, me. Maybe my family has room in there too, <laughs> if they go along with the way I am, <laughs> if they have their own ways, well then it's trouble in the capsule. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, how will one look and be? And is, is, we, we always come back to this, is one interested in finding about, out about this human being here in interaction with himself, herself, people. The trees, birds, what's the relationship? Is it open or coming out of this anchorage, this investment, this attachment? And if somebody says, this is where you're going to look, are you coming out of this feeling of protection, defense, then becoming defensive about the defenses? Oh, well, well, say, wait a minute, is, is there something, let me look. I can't answer right now, I'm going to look, be quiet. Is there defensiveness, was there defensiveness? And how quickly uh, the thoughts want to come up, no, I'm not defensive, you are, or, uh, or I'm justified or so, and not going for anything that comes up but watching it, letting it sort of peel, peel open. And anything is helpful in that. A therapist and a, a friend and coming here and having a meeting and uh, bumping oneself someplace and getting angry at the table. If, if we're interested in finding out about relationship, by relationship I mean how do we live in this world? Reactiveness then we'll be more attentive than if we, we, if we don't care, we feel things are good enough for me. I'm, I'm reading a book right now, somebody lent it to me, and it's a, it's a beautiful book, it's called I Am. And the author, Jean Klein, is most of the time pointing out, you're not this little thing, you're just everything. You are the whole, well, he calls that I am, what, what, the whole of what you are. 
Whereas we are concerned with I'm this, I'm that. We are concerned with this and that. Not just with I am. This is a different vocabulary he's using. But the interesting thing, the emphasis in that book is always on the whole, the completeness, the perfection of us. Which is a little bit reminiscent of what we were sort of hearing a lot at a Zen center. That we're whole and complete, we just don't know it. And if you hear this a lot, this can be a very inspiring and comforting thought. I'm really not just this little me. I am the whole thing. With, without any lack or loss, life or death, it's just this whole thing. It doesn't come or go, it's alive. But how long can you inspire yourself with a thought before maybe out of I'm this or that, depression sets in again because I'm less than he is, or, you know. But sometimes people have said that to me. They say, oh, you concentrate too much on our hindrances. Why don't you talk more about our perfection? Or, or uh, not the hindrances, but the wholeness. So they, they find that helpful. And then somebody says, don't talk so much about wholeness. I, want, I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> I want to hear about my fear. My paralysis and fear most of the time. I want to look at that with someone. So we we're, go along with everything at times. Go along, meaning not to say, well, you have to do this way, you mustn't do that way or so, but listening to the whole thing. Uh, hmm? At a moment of being awake, everything you could say as a teacher shows something. At the moment of being asleep, nothing is, we're dreaming. And then, can somebody wake us up? That was maybe your question. By pointing things out directly. For that you already have to be open, you have to be open and receptive. Or else? Hurt, counter-aggression, defense, withdrawal. now the listening to the sound of the leaves rustling and the birds, someone moving, the, the breathing, bodily sensations, some words being said, the sound of that, warmth in this room, the coolness coming through the openings. Not as words, but the listening. Words coming up about the wind, but that's just something coming up. It's not the wind, it's not the bird. The word is not that. Ooh.
the thought may come up, what's that bird? It wasn't there before. But it's just a thought. That ooh, 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 ooh. what's that? It's just what it is. That's even saying too much. And not to be under the compulsion, I must be aware. It's just listening simply. And then dreaming sets in, inattention sets in, and then comes a moment of attention again. And there everything is there. Let go of what was and not recriminate about it. I wasn't attentive, I should. Oh, mm, mm, mm. It's very simple. Maybe not easy, but simple. involves no effort, no trying or having to. These are just movements of the conditioned mind and body. And to hear and see it as that, not be caught up in it. I must, I mustn't. Because then there's no listening. One can also ask, do I have to make a decision, choose to listen, or does it just happen? One knows not how. Yeah, it's still early. I think we do. Um, going back to uh, the point, I'm sort of interested in this point where uh, everything is sort of on the table in terms of what we were talking about before. Um, again, as was pointed out, to the best that that's possible, maybe a feeling that there's no resistance to all the aspects of what's going on, to be there and to be looked at. Um, and that seems to imply a certain uh, state of looking and being with what is there. And what I'm trying to get a handle on is that when sort of hinted at before that somehow if there was that uh, to a degree that there's that openness that that how one would perceive 
would be sort of self-evident, implying less of, of a decision, actual decision-making process almost, as much as something that just uh, becomes more, well, obvious or clear in what way to move. And yet, it seems that, that the moment the movement comes in, it seems different than that uh, openness where everything is, is sort of there and no particular direction has yet been taken. Um, and we talk about this sort of intelligent intelligence operating, you know, I'm wondering, I mean I can see that in, in this looking, moment of looking, and yet it still seems something is more limited in, in what what is limit? What is uh, I'm with you, and uh, all of us are free to be with it. Um, where does the limitation uh, come in? Uh, and one example here we just recently discussed at infinitum whether to get a dishwasher or not. All the facts, or is that uh, a poor example? Finally it became clear we are going to get that dishwasher. Now getting it, where does the limitation get in? Of course, certain things we can't have. We can't have hand washing or so, but is that what you mean, that this decision now obviates or makes impossible other things we could have done? Or, or maybe you want to take a different example. Maybe you want to. Yeah, something that maybe isn't as much put on one as almost a demand from powers that be, so to speak, yeah. uh, where there's no, um, I mean, that's another aspect, too, we do create a lot of our choices, <laughs> because maybe of other things we're not looking at, and we think we need to make decisions because of a restlessness or whatever it is that may be going on, we're also not looking at it, and suddenly there are all these other options that we've we presented ourselves. So, but, um, you said the moment a decision has, or a way to go has suggested itself, limitations set in again. You said it's not as open as it was in just looking at everything. And my question is, why does that spacious looking need to end at the moment a certain um, direction is taken? You know, you leave the, leave the staff or go uh, to work or whatever. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Okay. So in other words, maybe the way we think of the firmness of even the words, you know, decision, you know, there seems to be a solidity to that. Maybe that's... An assumption. That's the assumption. Yeah. It's like whatever direction yeah. it goes, it's not... Direction either. Oh, no. <laughs> so if that, yeah, okay, if that, the tentativeness of it. Tentativeness of it, yeah. And a strong condition is a don't be tentative, be decisive. <laughs> and as we don't have to be that way, can remain open. You shake in your head, Tina. <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking, we, we, uh, we make these decisions and suddenly we decide the decisions are us, and that restricts us to certain things now that we've made this decision. We can't do anything else, because now we have this image to maintain, we've made this decision, and we suddenly are in conflict again. But is that necessary? I've, do we have to accept that? It seems when we do accept it, we are uh, consigning ourselves to always be in conflict. <laughs> but we're questioning that right now. I am, okay. uh, yes. I question it. I question it because I see myself doing it all the time. And then when something happens and I go, I don't have to do this. I don't have to think this way. All of a sudden, it drops away. It doesn't have that pull. And does it have to have that pull? I, I think, no, no, it doesn't have to. It just does out of it habit. Does. And then you, I, I put from a 
speaking for what happens with this person. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I put all this baggage on it, and I create a history of this decision. And that's where all the being stuck for me occurs. Whereas if you just kind of get up and say, you know, not say, oh, today I'm, I forgot what I was yesterday was this, and I'm putting this back on again. I don't, I don't, do we have to do that? I'm constantly asking myself, do I have to do this? In other words, we're investing our decisions with something at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. decisions anymore. I, I, I can't make decisions really. I feel that every decision um, is a kind of to be or not to be. Um, for instance, I'm here visiting my mother. It's been very, very painful. She's 85 years old and more than ever she has become very desperate to keep me here in Rochester or um, or have me take her there. On the surface, it looks like there's a decision to be made here. But there really isn't. The only thing I, I see that I can do is just while I'm here to be with her pain, to be with the pain that I feel, and To just be here while I'm, you know, with her. And then I had a ticket to go back and I, I go back. And more and more I feel at least the choices, so-called choices, that are being presented to me are of the kind, I don't know, I think it was Hamlet had this, this game, or, or the, the, in the Greek tragedies you have these choices where no matter what you do, it's it's a kind of a losing proposition. You're doomed. You're doomed. Yes, 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 you know. Well, so, isn't there something to it? <laughs> yes, but what I'm trying to say, exactly what I'm trying to say, that that uh, choices are, in, you know, there is that quality that no matter what you choose, it's doomed. You know, that, that there's the doomed quality to it. And um, at least the choices that are being presented to me in my life, the same thing with, with my relationship which in one sense is very painful. On the other hand, you know, so the choice would be, well, should I stay with this person? Should I, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm just dropping all this. Instead, exactly what you were saying, Tony, you just look at the process rather than choices of ends and means, just, just experience uh, oneself and everything else as in, in, in process. And that, that can be a, a relatively shallow experiencing or it can also have a depth to it because what I think is no choice, there may still be choosing what feels more right, pleasant, advantageous, or whatever, to me, according to my likes and dislikes. And I want to, I want to air that, personally. If that goes, I want to have, have the bottom aired, the root. And not deceive myself. Where, where the way I'm living, and I don't like to call it choice anymore. I, I follow what you're saying. Decision making, I, I don't have anything to do with it. I'm just living, doing this and this. But I still wonder where's it coming from? Where was it coming from? 
the way I'm living, the, uh, staying with her or him, not staying with him, going to see mom, yeah. going back conflict? home. Huh? Conflict that is underneath the decision-making process. Well, you continue looking, Tony, as you said. Instead of making decisions, you really just look at what's happened. That's what I mean by the process. Yeah. You're just, you know, uh, you're in and you're lo and, and, and you're in. You're participating as well as as observing the process. So you you don't stop looking, and certainly it's not a matter of of subtly just going with your likes and dislikes or whatever feels the most comfortable. And it's really stressful. That that's not what I'm talking about either. Because it could be that way. Yeah. Well, also, it would be important to look at a conclusion or assumption like, you know, things are doomed. You know, that seems like a big conclusion that um, could, you know, could be something to look at also. Whether if I make a choice for this or that, as long as it comes out of the self complex. It has a history of doom. <laughs> Maybe temporarily some pleasure and, and, and happiness, and then eventually something goes wrong again. Yes. And that's yeah, but who's judging that? And I judge, it speaks for itself. You don't have to judge. You just look at it. Not just here in a small circle, but all over the world and since time immemorial. I'll leave it open, but watch it if, it if it interests you. Maybe you want to refute someone. Therefore, you're going to leave this open. You're not going to buy this. That whatever decision-making comes out of the self-complex, and that's what I'm talking about. Me. My. If it's not an open conclusion. Yeah. If, if your decision is not in from an open place, yeah, that's from a closed Yes. Is this endless looking, looking, looking at the problem? Or is there a looking which is no longer problematical? It, it's problematic when there's, a, there's a, a strong sense of self that I'm looking and what I'm seeing is not great because all these are not, my life does not live up to the ideals that I have had for myself. That's when it becomes a problem. And one can really live in a very unideal life, but if one is not involved in, in the thought, oh my God, I've really compromised, you know, I, here I'm a certain age and things are very far from what I thought I should be, then that's, that's a big problem. In fact, that's real anguish and torment producing. So it seems to me that uh, it's the letting go of the, of the sense of the I-ness that is at the basic, uh, the basic point here. Now how does that happen? Simple when you listen, and then listen to the bird. And we're looking for clues, right? We're always looking for clues. But we don't have, in truth, we have none. Or somebody says, that's an assumption. There are clues you can get to, to find 
loss of ego or self-attrition, do this and this and this. And then the ego has something to do. Or oneself, the mind, feels occupied gainfully. And that all can be watched. Openly? Or already investedly? Shall we end here? We've got the trustees meeting.